Hello everybody, I am Don Counts. We are here at the Warrior Exhibit in Fayetteville, Tennessee, and we've got Linda Williams here. Tell us who we have today. Don, today we have Mr. Dan Dale, and he was in the Navy and served in Vietnam, and we're interested to hear of some of your experiences anytime, and especially in Vietnam. Okay. So tell us about your life when you grew up and what got you in the military. <laughs> I come from a military family. My great, great, great grandparents, my great grandparents, my grandfather uh, that I knew very well, he was an admiral in the Navy, rear admiral of the Medical Corps, which is as high as you go in the Medical Corps. He was a doctor. And he, of course, during World War I and World War II is when he served. So when I turned 18, I decided I was going to enlist in the Navy. I needed to go in the Navy. So I enlisted, and uh, I enlisted in the uh, officers, the Reserve Officer Corps, the NROTC. And I was in college studying engineering, um, but then needed to marry my sweetheart, and uh, I did, and I couldn't keep up an engineering program and working full time. So I says, okay, I'll go go to the uh, Vietnam, I figured. Anyway, I was gonna go active at that time. Um, they found the very first ship that was leaving for Vietnam. So two weeks after I said, I'm out, they said, you're going. Take your sea bag and I was put on a World War II tin can. A, a tin can is a uh, destroyer. That's what we call them in the Navy because the sh hulls are as thin as a tin can. Bullets can go right through them. Big engines, big guns. They were destroyers during World War II and I was put on one of those and uh, over to Vietnam I went where uh, we provided gunfire support and we were a shallow enough draft that we were able to go up the rivers and provide gunfire support to all those who were on land when the aircraft and the helicopters couldn't go anywhere because of the, the monsoons, the fog. Uh, the weather was so bad over there so much the time that you know we could provide that gunfire support. And I was working in CIC, the Combat Information Center or Intelligence Center for combat, and uh, so I, I worked with the scouts on the ground, I worked with the aircraft above, um, I worked on the radar, I worked electronic countermeasures as an intelligence petty officer. So that's what I did my first year in Vietnam. Of course, that was... Um, what year was that? That was 1967 into the beginning of 68. Um, that's where I got into all my Agent Orange. Uh, that was our drinking water. That was our cooking water. That was our shower water. We had no idea going up the rivers that smelled so bad of decaying brush. Uh, all the plants that had died, everything washes down into the rivers and we were up the rivers. So with the desalinization uh, that ships do, you know, to create salt water into drinking water, all it did was intensify the Agent Orange. So everything in me is quit by this time. Uh, it started quitting by the time I came back. So that's, that's my first tour of duty over there. It got a little more exciting. Uh, the USS Pueblo was, was an intelligence ship up near North Korea, and it was captured. And today, it is the only U.S. naval ship still showing commissioned that's being held in captivity. And the men that were on it were held as POWs. Because we were on a tin can, and I guess the ship's size would bring us in 
to the harbor in North Korea, we immediately went up to North Korea. But Johnson wouldn't let us take the ship, and he left the people in captivity and left the ship there in the harbor where it is today. Actually, they've moved it to a different harbor to show off the blood that's on it, the bullets that are in it. And I know some of the men that were POWs on it. That was about 40 degrees below zero, winter then, uh, December of 67, maybe January of 68. Anyway, um, the Tet Offensive started back in Vietnam, the Big Tet of 1968. And so we were immediately dispatched to get back as quickly as we could. And so we were back on the line uh, providing gunfire support to those that were on the ground, taking rounds ourselves, um, which was always exciting to here splashes around our ship as things would go off, missing us each time, and uh, hearing loud clinks against the ship when rounds were hitting our ship. So anyway, at that point I had been in Vietnam for a full tour, and uh, I was going to be able to go home and uh, see my wife and baby that I'd never seen before. Got back to the United States and they said, take your sea bag with you. Yeah, we should be like uh, near a year in port. They said, no, the battleship New Jersey has just been recommissioned and you need to make a trip on the battleship New Jersey back. They need petty officers from intelligence division that can work the radar and the electronic countermeasures equipment. So I had uh, less than a week back in the States and I went back to Vietnam, never having missed a month of combat pay, which was the best thing, extra pay. Um, so I got 22 months of combat pay with a quick, mm. quick turnaround yeah. back there. The battleship New Jersey is still today the most highly decorated ship in naval history. It was a World War II battleship and served Korea, served Vietnam. It's been decommissioned and recommissioned each time, being brought up to speed with new equipment and everything else. And uh, that's the reason I brought in a book because very few people have any idea what a battleship really looks like or what it can do. And I just marked off a couple of pictures of the actual battleship during, you know, that's a nine gun salvo, as we would call it. So all nine guns are going off at the same time. We oftentimes did that, especially if we wanted to remove a mountain. Remove a mountain, yes. It sounds a little strange, but remember, each round weighs between 2,100 and 2,200 pounds, and it takes six sacks of black powder ammo. Each sack is 110 pounds. So 660 pounds of black powder ammo is the charge behind these 2,200 pound bullets rounds we call them, and they would go 20 miles with dead accuracy. Sometimes, depending on the weather and everything else, we could go as much as like 22, 23 miles. And anyone who served over there on the ground in 1968 will be able to tell you of hearing what sounded like a freight train or maybe a Volkswagen flying through the air overhead. And those rounds could penetrate deeply into the ground to take out a lot of the tunnels or gun emplacements that were in the tunnels, and they would only pop out for a short amount of time. They would attack 
our ground troops and then they would pull them back in and nobody would know where, where it had come from. So sometimes we literally took out mountains. And uh, so we were a huge... Or oh, it, th we never got up the river in the battleship. <laughs> uh, yeah, our, our tin can was small enough, shallow enough, you know, that it could go up the rivers. We, we stayed just offshore as close as we could, sometimes into the mouth of the big rivers. Um, the Song K, the Mekong Delta, uh, big mouths on those rivers. And uh, so we would get right up into the mouth of a river there if we needed to fire inland, you know, considerable distances uh, with tremendous firepower. Um, and I had made notes 55 years ago, 55 years ago of the Tet Offensive uh, gunfire that we exchanged. We received the Navy Unit Commendation uh, with the battle efficiency E for combat action and the combat action ribbon for performance under fire, having fired 1,800 rounds in five hours. There were a lot of guns on that ship, and they were all going off at the same time. So my hearing isn't all that good either at this point. <laughs> but, tell, tell us something about the country. Were you in country? No. No, I, I never was on the ground. I was just staying in the water, up the rivers, or on the shoreline. What I saw of the country, beautiful inlets, beautiful sandy beaches. I looked at some of that stuff when we were really in shallow waters and said, boy, wouldn't this be a gorgeous resort someday? But uh, I've never gone back. I won't ever go back. I won't ever go back. I go to some of my ship's reunions, but not much need. Over 85% of the guys in my ships have, uh, have already died, most of them of cancer. So Agent Orange was horrible on any of us whether you got sprayed with it because you were on the ground or you were in the waters of it, drinking it. And they finally acknowledged it, the VA did. Uh, about 35, 40 years later, they said, yeah, even if you were in the shallow waters providing gunfire support, you were getting enough Agent Orange that it, it could cause damage and did. <clears throat> Everybody. Uh how did you make it through it? Interesting. I, I had no idea I was getting poisoned by it or anything. When I came back from Vietnam, <clears throat> I was a Los Angeles policeman. They were hiring, and I was a, an adrenaline junkie at that point. And my whole system was just all screwed up, and I didn't know what it was. And so they did a, uh, a scan of my thyroid. And they said, you don't have one. I said, what do you mean I don't have a thyroid? I understand it's a big thing right in my neck. I said, there's something the size of a BB I can see in there, but nothing bigger than that. You don't have a thyroid, and I've got no idea what happened to it. Forty years later, the VA said, ah, yes, an Agent Orange can cause hypothyroidism. So that was the first thing that happened to me. Um, then diabetes set in, uh, and that's a, a real common one from Agent Orange. And then my heart went into AFib, and I've been in permanent AFib now for, that I know of, for better than 12 years. Been treated for the, that. But the diabetes has turned into neuropathy. I can't feel my feet. I look like a drunk on a golf course, but I love playing golf because I can't keep my balance. When I'm standing over the ball, I almost fall over sometimes. And that's a, that's a hoot to people that are with me. You already been drinking? I, no, I haven't been drinking. Just don't feel my feet the same way other people right. do. Yeah. 
And that makes a difference in your balance. Yeah, it sure does. It sure does. But um, if you had it to do over, would you still go in the Navy? Oh, yeah. Serve in the military? Yeah. I don't like digging ditches. <laughs> 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 I couldn't see being on land, but it, it, it was it was history. And my son, he went in the army. He went in, you know, as soon as he could, no draft or anything. And then his daughter, my granddaughter, as soon as she turned 18, she joined the Marines. She said, Grandpa Navy, Dad Army, I'm going to show all you up. And she's only five foot two, little southern pistol, and uh, boot camp for the Marines for women is exactly the same as the men. They all go through the exact same torture, and uh, she kept up with the men, carried the same size pack on her back, and outshot most of them because she she's a hunter. So, military is in my history, um, and uh, Vietnam happens to be my history. I did 22 months, and then uh, Johnson decided he didn't want any more of the bad publicity. So, I got an early out because I had had 22 months of combat, and. Uh, I, that was my active duty time, and I did the rest as a reserve and came back home and joined LAPD. So that was my next... What did you do after that, and what led you to Fayetteville, Tennessee? <laughs> well, I got hurt real bad with LAPD, and they had to pension me off. Disability pension. My back was so badly broken up from an altercation. And... Uh, so I moved away from Los Angeles and I figured I'd go back and finish my education. So I got my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and my doctorate degree. <laughs> and they say those who can do and those who can't teach. So, so I began teaching firearms, teaching survival and uh, doing, I, I was a criminalist, but I uh, also had a law degree. So I was a law professor for 30 years in college. And uh, then I retired as the dean of the college in Central California. Wow, what a career. So after I re retired from teaching, I moved to San Luis Obispo, California, and I still have a home over there, and uh, started up uh, an American Legion Riders group to take care of all the events that could possibly be thought of and needed for funerals and escorts and, you know, ceremonies. I became the commander of the American Legion post out there, the VFW post, and then I just got sick of California and their liberal politicians and their stupid ways. You can't fix stupid. That's what they say. And I know because it didn't used to be that way. I went to the same school my grandfather was a medical officer at UCLA that my mother graduated from UCLA and I went to UCLA. And Los Angeles used to be a beautiful place. And California still has beautiful weather, but the people have gone crazy there. So I decided to get out of it. My wife is a CPA. I said, where's a good place to live? I'm tired of giving all of my taxes to this idiot here in power. And uh, <clears throat> She said, well, we got five states that don't charge state income tax. And I said, no, that one, no, that one, no, no, way too cold, that one. Hey, this one's right over where our son lives. 
contacted him and says, I'm looking at buying a home out there. He says, well, I'm transferring to the Nashville office now. He's a federal investigator. So he says, anywhere within a you know, 50 mile radius would be just fine. I says, well, find me a place. I want good neighbors. And that brought me to Fayetteville. Well, we're glad it did. That's right. Good story. And you talk about good, awesome. good people. Oh, yeah. my God. You know, come, well, I've, I've been, I bought my home here in, I think, June or July, just of this last year. Um, I was on the road. I did it all by Internet. Had my son drive by and take a look at it. We were in our motorhome traveling through the Northwest at the time. I bought it and finally got into town here two, three months later. And so I went to the assessor's office, whatever it was, and turned in my paperwork. And they said, well, uh, do you have a VA disability? I said, yeah, I'm 100% disabled. Do you have a letter? Yeah, I do. That's going to save you on your property taxes. Mm -hmm. Holy mackerel. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. And then a license for one of my vehicles. Mm -hmm. And they said, you hunt, fish? He says, I'm going to. Well, here's a lifetime hunting and fishing license for you at no cost. <laughs> and all of the people were so sweet there at the square. I mean, I went from office to office getting to know the people in there and laughing with them. Laughing. So, yeah, I've kind of fallen in love here. Now, I didn't know in the South it could be so flippin' cold as it's been this week. <laughs> well, now that's unusual. That is. Very unusual. Well, I'm right there with you. <laughs> dang. <laughs> so well, welcome I, to Lincoln County, Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> so I just bought myself a tractor. I haven't figured out how to use it quite yet. But <laughs> I bet you do. You'll figure it out. I'm going to have to. I got 32 <laughs> acres of grass that gets pretty tall. And the guy I bought from, he didn't take his horses with him. So I've got horses and 32 acres and a herd of deer. Oh, yeah. Nummy, nummy. Yeah. Love venison. <laughs> well, we appreciate you telling us your story. Anything else? No, I think you've done an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. No questions? Uh, no. <laughs> we could probably ask you all day, but thank one, you. One question. Yes. Did you ever run across the hospital ship, the USS Repose? Yes. I wasn't on it, but uh, thank God. I got to know all the hospital ships that were over in Vietnam and knew them from Korea and World War II. Uh, as a rear admiral of the medical corps, all the hospital ships were in the purview of my grandfather. He oversaw them. He inspected them. Um, he was he was in charge of naval hospital ships, and his nickname was Bulldog Reed. My middle name last name Reed, and the reason for that is every time he'd come on to one of the ships, he'd set his little Boston Bulldog down, and the Bulldog would run through the ship, and everybody would go, Bulldog Reed's on board, square away. Because he he didn't want to surprise anybody. Yeah, he let them know he was. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty good. Well, thank you so much for coming and and talking with us today. I'm glad to do it. Glad to thank do it. You. And thank you for your service. Thank you.